Hello boys and girls, Greg from the Scary Spirits Podcast here to make you another cocktail. This week we are making the black and white cocktail. So we're going to take our shaker with ice. To that we're going to add two ounces heavy cream. Next, one ounce vanilla vodka. One ounce vanilla vodka. And we shake. Next, I'm going to take our chilled cocktail glass. And we're going to strain it in there. Next, we're going to take one and a half ounces chocolate liqueur. We're going to pour slowly to try to get it to sit on top. Yeah. Whatever. Next, we stir before drinking. Mine didn't separate very well. It is delicious though. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoy the podcast. See ya. Are we sinners because we sin, or do we sin because we are sinners? Lots of philosophical talk in this week's episode of the Scary Spirits podcast, The Addiction. But beyond the philosophy, this 1995 movie, filmed in gritty black and white, takes an interesting new look at the helpless vampire victim, implying that all you have to do is tell the vampire, with conviction, to leave, and no harm will come to you. Could you warn the vampire away? It might be harder than you think. Remember, people, with conviction. Cheers. Welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast. Please be advised that the presenters may use adult language and or discuss adult situations. This podcast is not intended for younger listeners or those that may be easily offended. So, if you're ready, let's go. Hi, I'm Greg. Hey, I'm Karen. And welcome to the Scary Spirits Podcast, the podcast that combines the two very different but highly compatible worlds of scary films and alcoholic spirits. What could possibly go wrong? Indeed. How are you, Karen? I'm fantastic. How are you, Greg? Could be better, Karen. Could be better. Well, you're about to be. Anything we need to cover from last week, Karen? We do. About necromancy? 
Yes. Well, we got, I got in trouble. You did. Yes. Apparently I do have fans that I run into. <laughs> <laughs> Not oh. in the grocery store. Right. Right. So this, so now we're, we're talking about brides of Dracula, right? Yes, yes. The one that came out several weeks ago. <laughs> yes. But I just got in trouble for not mentioning Courtney, <laughs> who I see very often around here. I didn't know she'd want to be labeled a fan. I was trying to, you know, help her out, keep her cool level up. But, you know, if she wants me to throw it out there that she's a big fan, thank you, Courtney, for being a big fan. Yes. Thank you, Courtney. We love you, too. She listens to us while she mows her lawn. In case anyone needs a, As you do. a reason to listen to us, you can just Put on the headphones and start mowing the lawn. That's what I used to do. So that's all I got. You got anything? Nope. You don't have any super fans that you see often. I do not. Maybe they're just keeping a low profile. They're just seeing you in the produce section and going, oh my God. Oh my God. That's Greg from Scary Spirits. Oh my God. Well, they'd have to watch the YouTube video to know, you know, it was me. Well, they could know though. They could say, wait a minute, that voice, it sounds familiar. (laughs) Where have I heard that before? (laughs) All right. No, I got nothing. So this week was your choice, was it? Was it not, Karen? It was. And what film have you chosen for us? Keeping with my back to school theme, I'm going with 1995's The Addiction. 1995, you say, Karen? Yep. You remember 1995, Karen? I do. It's a little clearer than the 80s. Let's just say that. (laughs) I don't think it is for me, actually. Oh, really? I don't know. Maybe. I had a two-year-old at the time. (laughs) I did not. (laughs) I had just finished school. I remember that. I had just finished school. With your doctorate, Karen? Yes, with my doctorate, which makes this movie very close to my heart. So you said why, right? Because your back-to-school thing? Yeah. And this does take place of a, it's a grad student, right? Yes, it is. Do you have a cocktail? I do. Go on. Even though this movie was filmed in 1995, it was filmed in black and white. And so the cocktail that I chose is the black and white cocktail. And how would we make that cocktail, Karen? You're going to need ice cubes, two ounces of heavy cream, two ounces of vanilla flavored vodka, one and a half ounces of chocolate liqueur. And if you're fancy, a chocolate swivel stick for garnish. You're going to fill a cocktail shaker with ice, add the cream and vodka, cover and shake vigorously until combined and chilled. Strain into a chilled cocktail glass. Slowly pour the chocolate liqueur into the center of the drink to make a layered black and white cocktail. Lay a chocolate swizzle stick across the top rim of the glass serve before you drink it you want to stir the layers together yeah so what's the point well it's presentation i thought they meant trying to make the the chocolate liqueur float on top but you think it was just to get it to the bottom yeah if you pour mine went to the bottom when i poured it in the middle yeah you couldn't tell because yours was white on white (laughs) no it was a little darker did it stay (laughs) on top it didn't no. No, it went to the bottom. And I even tried to use a spoon and float it on there, but no, it wasn't. This is the that. first one of all the layered ones we've done that mine actually did layer. And then I had to stir it. Yeah. <laughs> it's tasty though. It tastes like ice cream. Yeah, it's very good. All right. Gather your vanilla vodka, chocolate liqueur, and heavy cream. Shake away. Shake and make your own. Hold on. And we're back. Yes, we are. All right, Karen, might you have a brief synopsis of this film? I do. You want to hear a story? Yes, Karen. Tell me a story. After being bitten by a vampire, a New York grad student tries to come to terms with her new lifestyle and constant thirst for blood, adopting the philosophy of a nocturnal comrade. 
We are a match, Karen. Yes. <laughs> All right. You ready to get into it? Yes. Let's go. Before you start, where'd you watch it? I watched it on YouTube, Karen. Where did you watch it? I watched it on YouTube also <laughs> because that's the only place you can see it that I could find. You can watch it on Amazon if you have a subscription to something that I don't have a subscription to. So it is available on Amazon if you're special. But I will say I know that some of the scenes were missing from my YouTube. So have you seen it before? I have seen it before. Okay. I saw it in a theater. But the YouTube channel that I watched it on had ads. So Mine did I, not. I highly recommend finding the one that does not. It really takes a lot of the suspense out <laughs> when you go to an ad for deodorant. <laughs> you know, it just kind of, oh. Yeah, mine did not. I don't remember all of it, but I do remember certain things. And I know some of the things that I missed in YouTube. Yeah, I noticed a couple of times it was choppy a couple of places. Like it just seems to chop, you know, it wasn't a smooth transition. So I kind of wondered if they cut something. All right, The Addiction from 1995 in black and white. First thing we see is credits, Karen. And I wrote there's some cheesy 90s music playing over top of it. I thought it was cheesy. I didn't really notice it. I just noticed that it was white letters on a black background. And then we open to, I guess we're in like a classroom or something, or I don't know, they're, they're doing like a slideshow using real slides, Karen. Yes, like back in the day. <laughs> chikunk, chikunk. Yep. And they're talking about a trial, something about war crimes or something. I don't really know what they're. Yeah, that's really why get. it was hard to see because this is what the first place that I noticed that something was missing and probably the only place really, but in the original movie, they're horrible pictures of from the Vietnam war, from the concentration camps, and it's just dead bodies everywhere. And what they're talking about is they've basically tried a couple men and found them guilty of war crimes. And it's a philosophy class. And so the two friends were talking about, you know, how can one man be responsible for this? It's impossible. I'm going to say right here, Karen, a little too much philosophy in this film for me. <laughs> there is. They do use a lot of philosophical Ooh. speech. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, you do. They are horrific slides that you would be seeing. So by taking those out of the YouTube video film, they really did lose some of the effect of the opening scene okay so next we're sure we're seeing them walking down the street who we learn is kathleen and Jean, right yes walking down the street and there's dr drug and deals they're going on all yeah. over the place and there's people smoking pot and there's a song playing called i want to get high yeah and then Jean. so Jean and is it kathleen or Catherine? Yes, kathleen, kathleen are friends in the same program. So they're both in the, the doctorate program at NYU for philosophy. And Jean says, I'm going to go meet my brother. And so they separate. Kathleen says, I'm going to go this way. It does not look like the greatest area of town to be walking through. And then I wrote, it got dark quick. <laughs> like She's walking in and all of a sudden it's, it's dark out. And Kathleen is attacked by a woman. You see her kind of in the background, dressed in a fancy dress, and she checks out the students, and they start. she starts to follow her, and then they chat a little bit, like, nice weather we're having, or something like that. And the next thing you know, that woman throws her down into a stairwell. And that woman's name is Casanova. She's pretty. She looks familiar. Yeah. Casanova tells Kathleen to tell her to go away forcibly. Yeah, she says, Don't look ask. at me. Yeah. Don't ask me to go away. Tell me to go away. Look at me in the eyes and tell me to go away. But Kathleen begs, Karen. <laughs> she just begs her to stop. Yeah. Well, it's a weird thing. I think if you she panic. Asks, please, please, please. Yes. So I wrote there's nice shadow work here because they're kind of like under the fire escape, right? Yeah, there's good like shadow work through the whole thing. Yeah. Shining through the grates or whatever of the. So it almost looks like there's a cross on their face. 
because of the way the grates are. Yeah, or checker. We're more like checker marks. Well, the cross was in the beginning when they were watching the slides, and this is checkerboard. And uh, Casanova bites Kathleen on the neck. Kathleen seems in shock. <laughs> she does, as you would, I think. Next thing I have is Kathleen making a police report. Well, back up a little bit, because <laughs> the woman steps back and her mouth is all bloody. And she says she licks. We assume it's blood. Well, yes. She licks her lips and the blood off her face. It's very sensual what she's doing. And then she says, wait and see what's going to happen before yes. she walks off. And then we're in the hospital. And Kathleen's making a police report. They cop tells her if they find her then they'll have her come in to view a lineup. The other is to it. He's not much help. But Kathleen goes home yeah, yeah, to her apartment and she looks at herself in the mirror and I wrote, she still has a reflection. I made that note. <laughs> yeah. She's staggering around though. She's, she's still in shock. It looks like. Yeah. She's still got like a bandage on her neck and she's still got blood all over. Her. But she, yeah, when she's in the bathroom, she does have a reflection because you see her washing off the blood and she starts yeah. to cry. She cleans herself up and she cries. And she goes to bed. She does go but to bed. But it's not an easy night. Nope. She begins having flashbacks. Seems to be in a lot of pain. And then at once, somehow she ends up on the floor because she's lying on the rug. Yeah. She's remembering what happened and she's writhing in pain. It looks like sweating. Does not look pleasant. Nope. Next we see Kathleen in class. It doesn't look like she feels too good. Yeah. And the professor's talking about determinism. <laughs> you want to know what determinism is? You'll you'll actually like this one. <laughs> so they're all. You don't have to tell me, Karen. Come on. <laughs> they're all philosophy classes, and they're going for their doctorates. So it's complicated philosophy classes. But yeah, I'm just going to boil it down hurt. to the very <laughs> minimum of what determinism and determinism in philosophy and science is the thesis that all events in the universe, including human decisions and actions are casually inevitable that all events in, like as they said including human actions are ultimately determined by causes external to the will so some philosophers say that individual human beings have no free will and cannot be held morally responsible for their actions they just react to whatever outside stimuli there is yes it's not your fault basically which is an interesting thing to be talking about considering what's happened to her and what she's about to do. But yeah, she's not feeling well. She has to leave class and go throw, throw up. Go vomit. Yes, she does. Next we see her in the hospital or the, I don't know, they call it the infirmary later, don't they? Or something. Yeah. I called it the hospital, but she could be in student health. <laughs> All right. Probably is. But they tell her the wound is not infected and it hasn't, had time to show any signs of like an AIDS infection or anything like that. If that's what she's worried about, the doctor says. Yeah. So they brought that up, which was interesting. So I looked it up. What year was the peak of AIDS? What do you think? I don't know. I mean, I remember first hearing about it like in like late seventies. Yeah. You know, so well, I would say early nineties, probably. HIV-related mortality rates, which rose steadily through the 80s and peaked in 1995. Hmm. So I'd give you that one, the yeah. year this movie was made, which I think is why they talk about it. And they've declined significantly, more than 80% since its peak and almost 50% since 2010. Of course, they have medications and things to help control it now. So, But when this was made, it was the peak of the AIDS epidemic. So they did throw that because you don't really hear about that like in movies or anything anymore. So it kind of was shocking that they said, if you're worried about AIDS, we can't tell yeah, it's yet. Probably about the same time, like um, the Tom Hanks film came out, right? Philadelphia story. Yeah. Or whatever. It came out around that same time. Right. I don't know. Probably. Eh, it might've been earlier. Even. Right. I, don't I don't know, but it was a big deal back then. And that's one of the ways it was spread was through needles and, you know, saliva. So if they can't tell yet if Blood. she's going to have an issue. Yes. 
transfer of blood or bodily fluids, whatever. He says her tests are pretty normal and she's probably, she's had chronic anemia and it's just, you know, this traumatic event has just exacerbated it. Like, you know, you're going to be fine. Yep. They're going to keep her for a few days, which was pretty funny because if that's all that was wrong with you, they wouldn't keep you now. <laughs> They'd send you home and they just want to build her up with fluids. And well, the college infirmary may keep you. They might. Yeah. So they're going to yeah fill her up with fluids and give her iron. Yeah. Lots of iron. But Kathleen gets up in the middle of the night and she leaves. Rips out the eyes. Yep. <laughs> Grabs her stuff and she's out of there. Next, we see her sitting in the corner in the dark in her apartment. I wrote. Yeah, staring off into space. Then we cut to the next day. It looks like she's having lunch and she doesn't appear to have much of an appetite. And But Jean comes down six next to her and Jean seems very hungry, Karen. Yes, yeah, she does. <laughs> she's She's putting her Big Mac away <laughs> or whatever it is, her Whopper. Whatever, yeah. Back in the day when they were Big Macs and Whoppers. What, aren't they now? No, I think they're smaller now. Oh, I thought you guys like they're still called that. Yeah, I know, but I think they're smaller. And as the film progresses, Kathleen does not look better and better and better. <laughs> she looks a little worse for wear because her friend Jean says, asks where she's been. And she says, sick. And Jean says, no kidding. You look terrible. <laughs> but she's just taking antibiotics. She says she's taking them. But she does have some smart philosophical remark about medication, too. Yes, she does. <laughs> but Kathleen is staring at everything. Like well, she's got all the people. Well, she's got heightened senses, too, I think. <laughs> but anyway, they agreed to meet after class. They're going to go to some exhibit or some shit. Right. Yeah. Next is Kathleen back in her room again. Yeah. And is she hearing Hitler? I don't know. I didn't. It's German. There's someone speaking German. Well, she's very. probably <laughs> see because she's at, very she, emphatically. <laughs> she questions the sanity of doing a dissertation on these idiots, the people that they're talking about, which I think there must be some. She must be doing something about war criminals. Okay. Um, and so that would make sense. Yeah, sounded like Hitler to me. Next, we see Kathleen walking in the streets, and she finds a homeless man laying on the sidewalk. Yeah, I said it's dark, and there's very cool use of shadows. So you see her shadow approaching the homeless guy. And does she draw blood from him? Yeah, she, with a needle. Okay, because that, that cut real quick. So yeah. I can't tell if she was imagining it or if she actually did it. No, Until she... the next scene, we see her at home. And it looks like she's going to inject herself with the blood. Yes, that's what she does. Okay. But it's choppy in here. It is choppy. But she's playing with her arm to get a, a good vein. And we have flashbacks again. And we I think we see Kathleen as a little girl. That's what I think, like too. Kind of like a home movie thing. And we also see Casanova. Yeah, so she kind of looks like she's taken a hit and she's hallucinating. So the blood is kind of doing the same thing an opioid would, right? Yes, right. Then Kathleen gets up and looks in the mirror and she has no reflection, Karen. Dun, dun, dun. Next cut to class. Well, actually, it's the end of class. Professor is just finishing up whatever he's got to say. And we see Kathleen. I think, is she walking in at the very end? Yeah. Wearing sunglasses? Sunglasses that were made for like a blind person. <laughs> That's how dark she, and she looks like the Terminator. Yes. <laughs> she does tell the professor she's feeling better. And they are going to meet later. I think yeah. they go to... they're going to eat and review her work. He wants yeah. to see what she's written so far. Right. But I think there's a little more than that going to happen. Well, yeah, you we... know. Because when you see her, well, <laughs> I know, but when you see her, she's put on a nice dress. Okay. I didn't notice. Well, we cut to her getting ready to go, right, or something. She's in yeah. her apartment. Yeah. And, and I, I wrote she's covered all of her windows with blankets, but I later I think it's her mirrors. But yes, I I did the same. I thought it was either her one windows. would work. But she's covered all the mirrors in her house with thick blankets. And then she says, "Here's what she says as a philosophical thing: It makes no difference what I do, whether I draw blood or not. It's the violence of my will against theirs." So she's feeling the power now, but there's always some little 
philosophical thing like that thrown in there. Next, we see her professor and her and her. I think they're like at a coffee shop having tea and they're listening to a guy play the cello. Yeah. Is she dating her professor? No. That's not cool. And he's like, it's getting late. They should go to work. He must be on her committee and he wants to see her work so far. And all of a sudden, she, Kathleen gets sad about the music. And she's, it was the first she doesn't want to leave. She says, there's plenty of time for that. Yeah, she's coming to terms with her existence. And she'll get to the thesis in good time. <laughs> but then, yes, it's a cellist they're listening to. Yes. And it is sad music. So she says, let's go. It's depressing. Let's get out of here. Get to Kathleen's place and she invites the professor in. He tries to say no at first because it hasn't been an enjoyable evening so no, far. That's what he says. But she convinces him. They go inside and she offers him a drink and he says, well, what do you got? Whatever you want, she says. <laughs> yes, that's quite the line. And then she kisses him very passionately, Karen, I wrote. Yes, I would agree. And then she excuses herself, right? She, she says, hold on a minute. I've got something for you. Okay. And she leaves to go get it. And he's taking off his tie. He thinks he knows what she's got for him. And he's also looking at all the mirrors covered with blankets. But she comes back and says, give me your arm. And I wrote, is she going to inject him with heroin right here? Yeah, <laughs> it's all, it, looked it, like. it looked like it was all set up for, it looks exactly like a heroin injection would look, right? Yes. She's got a candle. She's got a spoon. She's taking something out of a little paper envelope and putting it in a spoon, right? But it's not heroin. Isn't it? It's blood. Is it? Yeah. I think it might be hers. Okay, because the next thing we see, he's out, right? Yeah, he's gone. He's passed out. Yeah. And but he's got two marks on his arm, right? Yeah. One says in and one says out. Yeah. So I think she injected him with her blood and then took some of his. I think this hey. is another part that must have gotten cut up because it sure did look like heroin, but but the color in the syringes was dark. Is heroin dark? I, I didn't know. even see this color in the syringes. Oh. I will admit I don't know what heroin looks <laughs> like. So, and I don't you don't have to say if you do or not, but it it looked like blood to me. And the in and the out implied to me, and it's written on his arm in marker. Right. It implied to me, I think she was trying to see like an experiment if she could turn him without biting. Oh. Okay. And while he's passed out, she takes the money from his wallet. Yeah, what he's gonna notice. I yeah, I don't know what that was. That all was about. weird. Yeah. Next, I guess it's the next day, and Jean and Kathleen are walking in the street again. Kathleen stops to flirt with a guy. I wrote. Yeah, there's a group of young black men that are hanging out outside a certain store, and she must walk by them every day to get to her apartment because they kind of seem to know her. And they usually say something, but she just keeps walking. But this time this she time actually she stops. Not. She stops. Yeah. <laughs> and asks what his name is. And he says his name is Black. You'll be seeing me later. <laughs> yeah, but her friend pulls her away. So next we're at the library, apparently, Karen. Yeah, in a voiceover, she calls the library a graveyard. And the students are drawn there like flies. It's very dark and dingy in there. You know, it looks like a classic library or something, not like a modern library, because most of those are lit up. But it's like an old, like you can just tell it's old and dusty, and it's probably the philosophy library, not the main library on campus. I know that that's riveting, but that's true. That's well, true. I know she sits next to an anthropology student. Well, that's true, too, but it is very dark in there. Kathleen strikes up a conversation with her and whatever, and they decide to walk home together and maybe study together that night or whatever. And yeah, Kathleen says, Come on over. I've, you know, I'm studying all night. You can join me. And the yeah. girl's like, Okay. Yeah, we'll make coffee. Next thing we see is the girl crying tending to her wound, yes. looking at herself in the mirror. So apparently she got bit. She's crying in the bathroom. And she asked Kathleen, How could you do this to me? Doesn't this affect you at all? And Kathleen says, no, this was your decision. And she said, Kathleen says, what the hell were you thinking? Like, why <laughs> would you just go off with someone you just met? 
to their home, you know, it was kind of a, cause I thought the same thing. What are you doing? You don't know this person, but Kathleen's very calm and you're right. Says it was your decision. And the girl shakes her head. So Kathleen must have said again, tell me to go away. And she didn't. Yes. And then Kathleen says, it's not my indifference, but your astonishment that needs study. Like, why are you so surprised? You walked home, you walked off with someone you didn't know. You didn't say go away. So why are you astonished this even happened to you? It feels a little, and I don't know if they were going for this or not, but victim blaming yeah. a little. Like, I don't know if that's well, a lot. <laughs> right. Like, well, I don't know if they were intending to do that or if that's just something you know, because all she had to say was go away, but someone's about to attack you. You're not in your right mind. I suppose. Next, we see Jean and Kathy. Apparently, they're walking in one of the school buildings. I guess it must be after class or something, and they're leaving. Then they're about to leave the building, and Kathleen walks into the light. Her friend Jean, it's Jean, and Jean is very worried about her. She tells her she looks terrible. She needs to slow down. But yeah, they're about to walk out together and they do. They walk into some sunshine. And, and Kathleen says she forgot something upstairs. Go on without her. It's going to take me a while to get it. Next, it's dark now, Karen, and Kathleen finds the kid. It did take her a long time <laughs> <laughs> to find. No, she was lying, obviously, waiting for it to get dark. Yeah, Kathleen finds the kid that she talked to earlier in the street. Black, yes. Yeah, said that. I'll find you. So they begin walking down the street hand in hand. And he tells his friends he's going off for a booty call. Woohoo. He's and excited. Uh, and as they're walking, Kathleen begins squeezing his hand. <laughs> so she has some superhuman strength. Yes. Because, yeah, she <laughs> twists his arm and he goes down on his knees. And she tells him to tell her to go away. Just like they do everybody, Karen. <laughs> apparently, apparently that's yes. the modus operandi. so if someone comes up to you and says tell me to go away tell him to fucking go away <laughs> yes forcefully. that's what we've learned from this movie because he does not and no, she bites not. him right there on the sidewalk yep doesn't even go into an alley or anything nope and then there's a quick shot i think of sunrise yes it's hard to tell because it's black and white but i'm assuming it's sunrise and someone knocking on Kathleen's door, and apparently someone has sent her flowers, a pot of flowers. Yeah, I said it's flowers. Oh, wait, it's a plant. Yes. Because she starts crumbling the dirt in her hands yeah, with, with the utmost fascination. She likes the dirt. <laughs> because she got a hit of the blood, right? So she's fascinated. She, her mind is open, uh. and she's playing with the dirt. And we see more dudes getting high. A montage, I guess, of dudes yeah. getting high. <laughs> Everybody getting high outside. And next we cut to another one of the buildings, I guess. And Jean is walking and Kathleen is hiding behind a pillar and grabs her. And she's wearing, Kathleen's still wearing her dark, dark glasses. Yes. And Jean says, well, you're welcome for the flowers. So apparently Jean sent her the plant or whatever. But she is concerned. And Kathleen is now smoking a Marlboro. Yeah, and Jean says, and Jean says when, when did you yeah. start smoking? When she, since when do you smoke? So she's picking up more bad habits. And then she starts talking about some dude she met, the butcher or something, works in a slaughterhouse and just drives around in his meat truck, picking up hitchhikers. Yeah, I don't know if she was trying to explain <laughs> where she was. She was gone for a while or something. And so she says, yeah, I met a guy and I just went off with him for a few days. Or if that's true and she was drinking cow blood or something. I don't know. It was weird. Then Kathleen says, here, I want to show you something. It takes her to the girl's room, right? The girl's restroom. Well, Jean's getting more and more ramped up because Kathleen is spewing philosophy. And Jean says, I don't even know what you're talking about. Like she's <laughs> yes. just rambling different philosophical things constantly. Like she's having some sort of break with consciousness or something. And Jean's really worried about her. And she, she says to Jean to prove there's no evil. And 
Kathleen says she's covered all the mirrors in her house. Why do you think that is? What do you, what do I not want to see? What do I not want to look at in my house? And I'm thinking, well, you don't have a reflection, but that's <laughs> not it. She says it's her eyes. It's her eyes. Yeah. <laughs> and Jean says, you get to the infirmary. You're, you're in trouble. And but they do go to the girl's room. And while they're in there, Kathleen pulls out one of her teeth. Is that what yeah. she does? Yeah. She just pulls out a tooth and says, I'm rotting inside, yeah, but, but I'm not dying. dying. Yeah. yeah. Jean thinks she's a lunatic. Yeah. She needs to get some help. Jean keeps saying that. But Kathleen says that she is as terminal as Jean is. <laughs> she's just as addicted. Kathleen says to Jean. Yeah, but I don't think that's true. But anyway, not yet anyway. Then she looks her in the face and says, tell me to go away. I was surprised she went after her friend like this. I mean, there's think of all the people in New York. Do you really have to go after your buddy? Or is she sharing? Sharing. Yeah, okay. Just like the Lost Boys. You know. All right. <laughs> Keep that in mind, Greg. <laughs> Be one of us. But Jean says, I, I like this line. Jean says, you're hurting me. You're hurting me. And Kathleen says, are you kidding me? I'll crush you like cardboard. <laughs> yes. It's like, I like that line. Ooh, I'll crush you like cardboard. And Kathleen bites her. She bites her. And then I'm like, at this point, is she making vampires all over the city? What's going on here? Yeah, I think that's what she's doing. Kathleen. Well, apparently, <laughs> yes, she is. But I didn't know that yet. <laughs> Next, we see a montage of people walking in the street. I know was all that was about, except some are wearing sunglasses and some of them aren't. So I'm like, is this some just trying to let us know there's more vampires out there somewhere or whatever? But it is daylight, so I don't think they'd be walking around. You've just listened to half of this week's episode. Are you loving it? If so, can you do us a big favor and leave a review wherever you listen? Reviews help us grow the podcast. We just want to say thanks so much for your support. Now let's get back to the good stuff. Next we see Kathleen and she's in her apartment. And is she holding a baby shoe? Yeah. So I was wondering <laughs> if she had bitten a baby because yes. later that's asked of her. Yes. You know, and but I think we I think that might have been something that was cut out that she actually does because she is holding a baby shoe and she's looking pretty bad. Next, we see her walking in the street again and she's following a dude. And I good use of shadows again. You can see you see the, the man with his shadow and then you see her shadow coming towards him before you see her, which I thought was pretty cool. And the dude is Christopher Walken. That's what I wrote. That's what I call him the whole rest of the movie, too. Me, too. He has a name. He does have a name. And he tells her, why don't you tell me to go away like you mean it? <laughs> he, like, he, like, jumps the line on her, you know? Right. Then she knows that, you know, he's a vampire, too, or whatever. I said he's talking like addicted. he's a vampire. <laughs> whatever. He takes her back to his flat. And he explains that he's been fasting for four years. I think as they're in the elevator. 40 years. Oh, does he say 40? He says 40. I thought he said four. Well, I heard 40. Yeah, well, that's but he's kind of chastising her. <laughs> you know, your breath stinks. Um, you need to control yeah. your addiction. You can survive on just a little at a time. And then he asks her, has she been inside any kids? Like, has, has she bit any kids? Yep. And she and he tells her the first one's the hardest, but after that it's they're, easier. They're all just like all the rest. That's what he says. He says the entire world is a graveyard, and they're just picking at the bones. Yeah, and letting people know it's time. And his apartment's <laughs> pretty cool. It's like a warehouse apartment, you think? Yeah, it is. And it's kind of a mix of old, old and new. Like there's really new art, but there's really old furniture in it. He tells her she's not a person. She's nothing. He's pretty brutal. Yeah, and asks her talking about if, Nitsky. Well, yeah, and asks her if she's read <laughs> Naked Lunch, because Burroughs describes exactly what it's like to go without a fix. Have you ever read Naked Lunch? Nope. 
I saw the movie. They made a movie, and I remember seeing it and having absolutely no idea what was going on the entire time. I had not read the book, so I don't know if it's any easier to follow. And then uh, he explains that he's a lot like a normal person, but he does feed on her, Karen. <laughs> he says he, you know, can go out in the light and has a job and everything. Yeah, he's almost human. His name is Pen- Penna. Something, like, something that. like that. And she asks, what do you want from me? And he says, no, what do you want from me? I thought at first that she had gone to him for help, like found him as a vampire and was going to try to learn from him. But that's not true. Because no. he says, you were going to force me into some alley. Yep. And you know nothing. You understand nothing. And mm-hmm. I'll show you what you are. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and he just the next thing we see, he's brushing his teeth and rinsing his mouth out, and, bl- and there's thick blood. You know, he's all ch- tra la la. <laughs> yep. He tells her he will take what little of substance is left in her. Yeah, whatever is good in her, he said he's going to yep. take. So he's been clean, for lack of a better word, for like 40 years, and he can't, and he drains her like. It's there's slurping sounds. It's pretty, pretty yeah. bad. He tells her that she will just feel like she hasn't eaten in weeks. She tries to kill herself. Do you see? She grabs a straight. Well, does blade. she? Kathleen crawls to the bathroom and slits her wrist with a straight razor. Christopher Walken tells her that she can't kill what is already dead. Yeah. And she doesn't bleed. And I think it's because he's drained most of the blood out of her. He tells her, eternity's a long time, get used to it. He also tells her, you were not trying to kill yourself. You were just seeing if there was anything left that you could feed on from yourself. That's pretty brutal. He says, you just wanted a fix. Yep, anything for a fix. (laughs) Next cut to Kathleen walking in the street. And she's desperate. She's begging for help. Yep. Rattling the, the grates that are over the stores you know, stumbling around. She looks like she's in the throes of withdrawal because he's taken all her blood. So she has nothing in her system. And then she collapses. She just collapses and lays there. A man comes up, finds her and picks her up. Is going to carry her away to get her help. And she bites him. Yep. (laughs) That was a bummer. He was just trying to be nice. And next we cut. And I said, is she writing her dissertation? It's like she's she's like cramming. She's writing her thesis. Okay. So she got a hit. So imagine, I would imagine it's she had. So he's drained her of all her blood, Christopher Walken. So she's like, she hasn't had a hit in weeks and weeks. And then she feeds again. So the hit must be big, right? Because she doesn't have anything in her system. So the first hit after you've been clean for a while is always tricky. I hear people talk. <laughs> so she is like, inspired she's writing her thesis like nobody's business tap 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 away on 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 her big 1995 was it a mac tube monitor yeah (laughs) and next we see she's like talking to a committee yeah she's in her thesis committee exam so when you get in at least in my experience and from what it looks like here when you get a dissertation you don't just work with one professor. So you you generally work with one professor, but you have to have a committee of five or six other professors who guide you and approve your thesis. So you don't only go in one direction with one thought and theory. You get everybody's input to make sure you've covered everything, basically. Cut scene and we see Kathleen's doctorate of philosophy. Woo woo. She's a doctor. So that could have been her thesis defense, too. Once you write it, you have to present it and defend it, they say, to questions and things. It was all about our impact on others' egos. So she passed the test. She's now a doctor. Yep. And then she invites people to a graduation party she's having, right? A small get-together after the reception. (laughs) Yes. Including her professor that she's already bitten or or injected whatever he was yeah so she's all dressed up she's feeling her accomplishment but she 
I don't know if this was a voiceover or she says there's a, there's a dual nature to addiction. It satisfies the hunger, which evil engenders, but it also dulls the perception of how sick we are. If that, you know, like if she's riding in a cab, putting on makeup. Yeah. And I wrote, she compares her affliction to that of alcoholism. Yes. So you know, she, you need to satisfy your hunger, but once you do, it dulls your perception of how sick you are. So it's a vicious cycle that, you know, you can't get out of. And then we see a preacher out on the streets handing out pamphlets, Karen. Thank God loves you. Yep. He gives one to Kathleen and she invites him in, but he refuses. Then we, Kathleen's in her, is she in her apartment? No, I think it's or is this she, where they were having like having a party or something. Yeah, this is where the party's going to be. She's probably rented a room on campus or something, and she's like yeah, in a she's, utility closet, right? Freaking the fuck out. Yeah, it looks like and she's trying to resist. At first, I thought she was really mad that she couldn't get the priest to come in or the guy that was handing pamphlets. Like she yeah. didn't have the power to get the influence to get him to come in. But then that's not what it is. She's freaking no. out because. She's having an inner conflict yes. of whether she's going to be able to resist or not her temptation and her addiction. And right. she's like throwing herself all over the room. Yeah, tears off her clothes and she says she will not submit. But they cut to the party and it's kind of elegant. There's lots of people there. Lots of people are recognized. <laughs> Me too. So yes, people. The anthropology she students there. Jean is there, her professor that she injected or whatever is there. The man who helped her up in the street the is there. The cab driver. The, the black young kid man. is there. Yeah. The black kid's friend. <laughs> yep. So I didn't know if she did that or he did that. <laughs> I don't know. But yeah, so that answered my question. Is she making followers all over the place? Is she the leader now? You know, like, but yes, they're all at the party. She's invited them all. <laughs> yep. She's at the party and. Um, well, she's not at the party yet. No, she's still in the closet, but Jean yeah. goes to look for her. Yes. And finds her. And then Jean brings one of the guests to Kathleen. Well, Kathleen says, find someone whose clothes will fit me and bring her here. Oh, okay. So Jean looks her. around the party, <laughs> finds a woman and brings her in. Yep. And then they both bite her. Yep. Kathleen and Jean. So then Kathleen comes in the party in her new dress. <laughs> right? Her new borrowed dress. Yes. And she begins to give a speech about wanting to share what she has learned in all of her years there. So there is a missing scene here, too, because I do remember it. Before, right after she does that, there is a locking of all the doors. Oh. Uh. I don't remember if it was the other people she's fed on or what, but there is a close up of like doors being locked because that left an impression on me when I watched it the first time. So they didn't show that in the version I saw, but yeah, yeah. me either. So nobody can leave. And she bites the Dean who's standing next to her. Yep. He's looking very proud. <laughs> I know he was so proud of her. Getting her doctorate, and then she bites him. And then all the other victims, all of her other victims at the party, start biting all the guests. It's a free-for-all and just <laughs> a gory mess. It's brutal. And then Casanova arrives, and she feeds as well. Yeah, it's just massive feeding. Yeah, and I wrote, they behave like a pack of zombies eating the living. <laughs> Like if a horde of zombies attack, that's what they reminded me of. Like from The Walking Dead or Night of the Living Dead or whatever. You know, they just converge. From one one to the next to the next to the yep. next. Like and and they and it's just people are screaming, trying to get out. They can't get out because the doors are locked. There's just screams upon screams upon screams. And it's brutal. But actually, when I first saw the film, I didn't think this scene was funny. But there is a sense of, I don't know what the right word is, but after 
when you go to get a dissertation, there's a lot of work and a lot of learning and all of that. And then at some point you have an advisor who has trained you right over these years. And just when you're starting to get really good at what you do, you know, you're ready to graduate, but they want you to stay because they've trained you and you're producing a ton of stuff and you want to leave because you're like, Hey, I learned all this stuff. Let's go. So there's sometimes a little bit of conflict, you know, between your committee or your advisor and yourself. I was lucky enough. I didn't really have that a little, but not a lot. But some people leave after they get their dissertation and they never speak to their advisor again. That's how brutal it got. So just having your whole committee in a room <laughs> after you've been through all that and then just having them murdered brutally. Well, I don't know. They, are they murdered? Well, I don't know. Or are they just all now a pack of vampires? I don't know. I don't know what. I feel like they messed some of them up pretty good, though. Yeah, there wasn't much left. Like when there was them. that last one, they were on, I think it was the lady in the fur coat. But yeah, there were like and five was, or six of them all. Like and they, one and it was still towards the end. So they were, you know, it's not like, the, yeah, it was pretty ugly. So I don't know. I don't know if they're vampires. We never find that out. But yeah, it was it wasn't a nibble. No. They were desiccated pretty much. And I wrote, Kathleen seems to have overindulged. <laughs> yeah. She acts like she's going to like throw up for. Yeah. She's over. Times. She's overdone it. Yeah. She's a little bloated. <laughs> she's had a little too much. And she walks in the street again, covered in blood, bloody mess. I assume could be chocolate syrup. Who knows? I hope it's chocolate syrup <laughs> and not real blood. But people do come and offer to help. Yeah, call nine one one. Yep, and they take her to the hospital. So we see her, see them wheeling her into the hospital through, down the halls, and she's just covered, yeah. like head to toe. Yeah, even like when they hair. find her in the street, like people are like looking to see if she has where where she's cut. You know, right? <laughs> she's covered in blood. Next, we see Kathleen asking her nurse to let her die. And the nurse yeah. says, no one's going to let you die, honey. <laughs> she doesn't say it like that. but She kind of does, a little bit. And Kathleen stares at a crucifix in her room. She asks the nurse to open the blinds in her room to let the sun in. And this was a good shot, too. Yeah, I really like this, too. So the nurse cracks the blinds open a little bit. I mean... I so was you see expecting thin... her to say more, more. Well, yeah, I thought she was going to explode in the bed, but yeah. no, she then cracks them. And we see that as the sun moves, we see the light from the coming through the blinds, inching down the wall towards her in the bed. Yeah, as the sun's coming up. Yeah. And then it hits her in the face, and she starts, you know, experiencing a little cry. pain. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, it's really cool as it inches down getting closer and closer <laughs> and closer. But Casanova arrives smoking the Marlboro in the hospital and she shuts the blinds. <laughs> yep. And she calls it the seventh circle and says Dante described it perfectly. Yeah. She says, not that easy. She says, we're not sinners because we sin. We sin because we're sinners. Yeah. And then she says, or to put it more bluntly, we're not evil because of the evil we do. But we do evil because we are evil. <laughs> yes. And she says, we have no options. Exactly. Next, we see a priest arrive in Karen. Yeah, and he's an older gentleman. It's yeah. like, oh, she got to take him out. He's got but, a rosary and a Bible. But he gives her the last rites, right? Yes. He gives her the body and blood of Christ, and then he does the oil on Well, he gives forehead. her the body. I never see her give him the blood, give huh. her the blood, but whatever. But she wants to give confession and well, he she... asks if she's Catholic and she says, yes. Well, she says she knows she's been baptized, but she's kind of whispering. And I like, oh, because I don't remember the movie after they destroyed everyone in the. Well, in the all she room. says is, forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. And that's it. That's well, the... but he's leaning closer because she's kind of speaking that's her softly. Confession. And I thought, oh, God, she's going to take him out, you know, like right oh, there in the hospital. Yeah. She just says, God, forgive me. Yeah. And then he blesses her, gives her last rites and says all her sins are forgiven. 
easy peasy lemon squeezy. Yep. Next, we cut to a graveyard, Karen. Well, wait, it's... there is one thing he says, too, just because it's kind of funny, not funny, but he says, by the power of the Holy Spirit may keep you in eternal life. I almost made a note of that. And I was like, <laughs> oh, OK. So and she I think she's like, oh, no, <laughs> not that. no. <laughs> Next, we cut to a graveyard and it's her grave. Yeah, which I didn't quite get. And she was born on Halloween in 1967. Karen. She was. I and died November 4th, 1994. At the bottom, it has inscribed, I am the resurrection, I believe, from the book of John or something. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how she pulled this off. That she but she's pretend. leaving a rose on her own grave. So I don't know. I don't know either. And then as she's walking away, she says to herself, revelation is annihilation of self. Right? Yep. yep. And she walks past an Adam and Eve statue in the cemetery. And at, at the top of the statue is Jesus on the cross. Oh, is that what it was, Adam and Eve? Yeah. Yeah, it just says it pans up to a large mon monument with a crucifix atop it. The end. The end. Credits. Want to get high. <laughs> <laughs> so I do have something to say before we sum up a little bit. All right, hold it. Hold. Go on, Karen. <laughs> so in reading a little bit about this film, one of the things that somebody mentioned was how the lead character kind of embodies all the Gen X angst, you know, that was thrown around. So I just was kind of looking around the internet and I found this about Gen X angst. Okay. Cause we will admit we're Gen Xers. Proud. Gen X. Yes. People wonder why Gen X is so angsty. But for those who are a part of the generation, the answer is clear. The lives of those in Gen X have seen high divorce rates or two working parents, the threat of nuclear war, AIDS before life-saving medications, rising crime, the inflation of the 80s, the recession of the 90s, when most were graduating from high school or college, and the first and second dot-com NASDAQ crashes. Considering the past couple of decades between the 08 financial crash, the coronavirus, the Iraq war, the entire adulthood of Gen Xers has been one big pessimistic clusterfuck. I did see too. I, uh, look, when looking up Gen X, I don't remember the Karen, numbers. I was a latchkey kid. <laughs> I'm not sure I would have trusted you as a latchkey kid. Mm. Gen X has the smallest number of members. <laughs> Like the small, like boomers and millennials have more. We're like the least, hmm. they call us the middle child because nobody <laughs> pays attention to us. It's all boomers and millennials, which is just the way we like it. We don't yeah. care. <laughs> just the way I like it. We I, just go I, about I doing, our, doing our business. <laughs> you do you. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, I just thought that was kind of funny. But she's a very Gen X character, I think. All right, Karen, what were you pleasantly surprised or liked about this film that you picked? I like that this you film. had seen. This film affected me when I saw it the first time. Did it change your behavior, Karen? No, but I think it was very <laughs> close to home. Like it was something that I had experienced the doctoral process, not the vampire part. <laughs> but I liked it was I thought it looked gritty in black and white. I really liked that about it. I thought the shadow use was really good. Um, I thought the acting was really good. I was surprised at how many famous people were in it. I didn't remember that about it. I liked the story. I liked a lot about it. Did you like anything about it? Oh, I, I liked it. The philosophy and all that shit went a little over my head. But I, I, I think I got the gist of what they were trying to do. <laughs> We're trying to say, you know. Yeah, I agree. I think that's the only thing I didn't like about it. I think it went a little too fast, but I'm sure if you looked at it, everything that they were talking about, it somehow related to what was happening to her. But it was a little bit academic. It kind of needed to be because th I think they were trying to parallel the philosophy with being a vampire. It's also a one big corollary to drug use and that's mm -hmm. why the vi the victim blaming was a bit 
harsh to me. Drug and alcohol abuse. Yeah. Like you say. could control your addiction. That's what Christopher Walken says, or yes. you don't have to take the hit. Like you don't have to do it. Just tell it to go away. Just say no, basically, which right. we know doesn't work. Right. So depending on your some personality, people, it does. Well, sure. But some people who don't have addictive personalities and stuff, it's easy I mean, to I just quit say smoking. no. Cold turkey. You know, Some I people smoked for God, 20, over 20 years, probably. I was, was a it, pack a day when I quit. Did you quit because it cost too much or did you quit because you had a kid or? Well, I had a kid. He had told my mother that he didn't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Straight to the source. <laughs> right? And and also I, um, I got um, like walking pneumonia. Oh, so that you weren't allowed to smoke then? Well, Were you I could. In the hospital? Oh, I could. No, I was at home. I could oh. smoke if I wanted to. <laughs> it wasn't very pleasant. And the doctor said, well, now's a good time to quit. And I did. I kept a pack of cigarettes in the house the whole time, just you in still, case. Do you still want one when you smell yes. it? <laughs> yes, I do. Still want one when dinner's finished? Smokers don't know dinner's uh, over until you're, till they light up. No, not so much. No, but like a concerts and stuff yep yeah i would imagine <laughs> that's kind of what i didn't like about it all the philosophy stuff and a little bit the victim blaming whether that was intentional or not but it almost had to be right well, she certainly could not control her addiction i mean she beat herself up in the utility closet and then went out and slaughtered everybody she's yeah. no christopher walken guess not but i don't know but he gave in too yeah it's he relapsed it's willpower some people have more than others <laughs> that's all i mean it's plus when you're talking about opioids you're, you're talking about chronic pain and you know like there's a lot of different things that go into that it's not just yeah there's hey i'm hey i'm gonna are, get high you know are, and withdrawals include physical yeah it's even though i don't know you know i'm not an expert but the, could be psychosomatic. I don't know. I would just say I'm glad I don't have an addictive personality for <laughs> opioids. I do have one for shoes. So, you know, <laughs> we all have our things or camera equipment or, you know, everybody has their thing. Luckily, mine is not alcohol or opioids. So, but I still spend a lot of cash. So, you know, <laughs> that I shouldn't, but I have pretty shoes. And I agree. I thought the acting was really good. I really liked it. It's different. thought it was well shot. Yeah, it's it's kind of artsy. Yeah. If you're looking for that kind of thing, it's got a lot of shadow work that's really really good. I would like to see an uncut version because I think you know one of the producers was Russell Simmons. I think he was the main one. It was shown in art house theaters. I don't know how successful it was. It says the box office three hundred and two thousand. It's not a lot. It ain't a lot. Even back then, a lot of people have never heard of it. I would have liked to seen Christopher more Christopher Walken. Yeah, it was a very subdued performance by him. I think I don't know if it was subdued. Well, but <laughs> you didn't just look. I mean, you did look and say, "Yes, that's Christopher Walken." But at the same time, it was a good part for him. He played it really well. I didn't notice his talking cadence as much as I usually do, or I don't know. I liked it. I thought it was good. He had a sophisticated but evil look at the same time. So apparently, originally, Christopher Walken was going to be the Casanova character. Oh, interesting. But at, when he read the script, he thought that the character he ended up playing was a male character when it was really reversed. Oh, Pina or whatever was supposed to be a female, but I guess as he's reading the script, he didn't read it that way. And that's the part he wanted to play. Well, when Christopher Walken wants to be in your little independent movie and he wants to pick his part, I think I'd give it to him. Who played Casanova? Annabelle Sciora. Sciora? I Annabella Sciora. I, I looked her up. I didn't really... I mean, she, she was looks the things familiar. I've seen, but I don't think I remember from those things. And Edie Falco was mm -hmm. in uh, Nurse Jackie and The Sopranos. Mm -hmm. I read a lot of the people in this film were in The Sopranos. 
but the director had battled heroin addiction. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, so that he makes purposely sense. made this an explicit metaphor for drug addiction. Well, someone must have been a philosophy student at some point. <laughs> yeah, she says she's she submits to God before being reborn in the conclusion. Well, see, all vampires are cool. These are intellectual vampires, but and I love them, and I love the Lost Boys. <laughs> I just think vampires are cool. It's just a different take, a different approach to them. You've read Anne Rice, right? And nope, no. Well, okay, but th- there are. I've seen there, an interview with the vampire, but I've never read Anne Rice. There are vampires in the fiction that resist that are angry they're vampires and don't want to be vampires and fight against it and there was that element but there was also an element where casanova just bites her and leaves her and doesn't really tell her anything she's just like wait for what's going to happen next a lot of the vampire lore has your maker kind of take care of you and explain things and help you yeah and in uh interview with the vampire Lestat, one of the main vampires, that's one of his major complaints is his maker just made him and left. So he had to figure it out on his own. And the, you know, instead of getting any help from anyone. And I couldn't tell if Kathleen was helping the people. Obviously she was still in touch with them because she invited them all to the party. So was she creating her own coven of vampires or it was hard to tell. Or were they just a product of her addiction? Yeah. <laughs> right. And then they just, she just said, hey, let's all have a drug party. Come on over. You know, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty artsy. And it's free. I would say watch it. Uh, I would say more than, I like it. <laughs> or at least our, the, there are free versions on YouTube. Yeah. And they were, even though they were black and white, they weren't so dark that you couldn't see anything. Sometimes when they're on YouTube, you can't see anything. You don't know what's happening. I could see yeah, everything. I feel like sometimes they're like bad copies. They're like copies of copies or something yeah. that people post. But yeah, you know, the one I watched seems pretty, you know, crisp and clean. And obviously, there are missing parts in some of them. But and the ending was a little odd. Like she visits her grave, but we don't know how that how she pulled that off. Right, but I guess if they're, you know, they're saying she was trying to say she was reborn after. I know, but how do you get giving herself to God or whatever? And it was dark though when she visited her grave, right? It wasn't light out, was it? Uh, it was light. Mm-hmm. It was light. So she's then must be controlling her addiction like Christopher Walken was because he said he could walk in the light. And... All right. What kind of cocktail rating, Karen? I'd give it a two. But I don't know if you're going to fight me on it or not. No, I think two is fair. It's artsy. It's different. It's good filmmaking. I thought really good. And I think the director, the director started porn or something, something. I don't know. He had a, Like I said, he had a heroin addiction. So I don't know. Very violent movies. I do know that. He directed very violent movies. So this is kind of an outlier for him. It's a lot more sophisticated, I think, than at least from what I read. He did. He did make pornographic films. Early work. Did some slasher. I thought it was pretty sophisticated film. Well, he did one pornographic film anyway. All right, two cocktails. Comments on the black and white cocktail, Karen. I like it. Mine seems to have evaporated. <laughs> Funny how that happens. <laughs> it does taste like ice cream. It does. I think it's good. It's tasty. Anything we learned today, Karen? We learned about HIV and the peak of it. We learned about determinism. We learned about why Gen Xers are so angsty. We learned a little bit about dissertation committees (laughs) or the process of getting a dissertation or doing a dissertation to get your doctorate. We learned that Karen has an addiction to shoes. I think that's pretty well known. What do you have an addiction to, Greg? Everyone has an addiction. Horror films, Halloween. What do you spend too much money on? Podcasts. Podcasts. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we do spend too much money on this. That's true. (laughs) 
So basically, Greg's addiction is spending time with me. <laughs> While drinking. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's kind of a given. Most people that spend time with me need to be drinking. All right. Anything else, Karen? I don't think so. We gave it a cocktail rating. Said what we liked, didn't like, what we learned. I think it's your turn. Next week? Yeah. What do you got? Karen, next week, I have chosen the Hammer film. What? a ha- Wait, what? A Hammer <laughs> film? Yeah. I thought, we, thought I'd mix it up. <laughs> Do a hammer film from 1970, Karen. Ooh, it's going to be groovy. A film called The Vampire Lovers. Wow. I have not seen that. I haven't even heard of that. Do you like to know why I picked it, Karen? I would love to know why you picked it. The film was released on October 4th, 1970, a day before our next episode goes live. You always have such good correlations. Know what else October 4th is, Karen? Should I? What is it? Anne Rice's birthday. Oh, nice. <laughs> but she has nothing to do with this film. But I do love me some Anne Rice. I do have a cocktail, Karen, if you're interested. I was just going to ask you that. What is the cocktail you've chosen, Greg? It is called the Carmilla Useless Vampire Cocktail. <laughs> Okay. I didn't name it. What do we need for that concoction? We're going to need some gin. Okay. Some lemon juice from the plastic lemon. So far, so good. Some blood orange syrup. Okay. And some pomegranate syrup. And a dash of bitters. All right. Lots of mixers in there for you, Karen. Not really. Yeah, there is. Lemon juice. No, it's syrup. It's just syrup. Oh, it's not alcoholic? I do not believe so. How do you make this cocktail? He's putting everything in a shaker and shake it up and stir and serve. (laughs) All right. Well, that's good. Pretty easy. Easy peasy, as you say. Found it on YouTube, you said? I did. All righty. Looking forward to it. All right, Karen, anyone you need to thank this week? Besides my super fan? Besides your super fan. (laughs) Well, I want to thank our listener. There's a lot of podcasts out there. Thanks for spending time with us. What about you, Greg? Who do you need to thank? Well, Karen, we do have another new YouTube subscriber. Jingwei. Nice. New YouTube subscriber. So thank you. Jingwei or Jingwei. I don't know. It's all one word. I'm sure it's a pseudonym, Karen. (laughs) Well, we appreciate it. Pseudoname or not, we don't care. Just give us that thumbs up and subscribe. I do, of course, have to thank the band Verse 13 for providing all the music on the Scary Spirits podcast, Karen. The music does make the podcast better. It does. Anything else, Karen? Please drink responsibly. Yes. Thanks so much for listening. Want to keep in touch? Check out our website, scaryspirits.com. Follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Scary Spirits Podcast. Find us on YouTube at Scary Spirits Podcast. If you have questions or comments, you can email us at info at scaryspirits.com. To help us grow the podcast, you can leave us a review on Apple Podcasts. You know, we really do appreciate your support. And as always, please drink responsibly. (music) Thank you.